We're joined tonight by Fred Barnes, executive editor of the Weekly Standard, Fox News contributor, and Molly Hemingway, senior editor of The Federalist. Thank you both for being here. And do you know, I have to say that I think the president has acquitted himself so well, Molly, and I think it's wonderful that he will still take on uh, the, the likes of uh, John Podesta, if he has a like, uh, from, uh, from the summit, uh, take on the left-wing media, whether it's CNN or NBC, and still be leader of the free world. It's a bravura uh, performance, is it not? Well, I think that one thing that's really good about it is it gets people to refocus on some of the issues here. If you are concerned about Russian meddling in a campaign, and if people claim that they are, there are a lot of questions that haven't been answered. I understand, actually, why the DNC wouldn't want to turn over their servers to the FBI, but it's also interesting that yeah, Why FBI would you want to get the FBI between yourself and the Russian intelligence agencies? I can understand that too, Molly. But it's kind of odd that the intelligence agencies haven't been more direct about seizing some of these things or, you know, if they, if they are so concerned about this type of Russian meddling. The right. Podesta thing was actually spear phishing. That means that he stupidly clicked on a link that he shouldn't have in his email, which is totally different than the hack of the DNC, which has more criminal yeah. elements. But his to stupidity it. was persistent, was it not? Uh, and seemingly unending, and admittedly with the uh, aid of WikiLeaks and the national media, which couldn't wait for the next installment. And by the way, thank God the system did work, our system of a free press in that instance, but it was apparently dependent upon the good uh, offices and agents of the, of the, <laughs> the Russian, uh, Russian uh, intelligence uh, uh, agencies. Uh, Fred, your thoughts here. I, I, I mean, I... I he, he was an extraordinary performance, and, and we've got another day mm -hmm. for President Trump to demonstrate why he is the leader of the free world. You well, have to be heartened. You have to be proud. I was heartened. Uh, he had a great day yesterday with that uh, spectacular speech uh, in Warsaw. Today, he had this meeting with Putin that the New York Times had reported ahead of time that Putin would win this thing, and Putin got nothing. Putin now has to put out a statement uh, that, that he will never uh, interfere with uh, other countries' elections. He'll never try to do that. Now, uh, he, he may not mean it, but he has to put out a statement uh, saying that because why? It's not because they both agree that the U.S. and Russia needs <laughs> such statements. It's because Trump obviously imposed it on him. Uh, and look, people, I, I think, were right to doubt with the rookie president going in uh, to a session with the Russian leader uh, when there's no real agenda and Do it goes on for two hours and 15 minutes, but Trump did fine. Trump did fine. Trump is the president of the United States, and what we have are a bunch of Lilliputians, some of them in the left wing national media, some of them in the dim uh, party, uh, and some on the hard left in the deep state. Nonetheless, he is leading and without exception doing a marvelous job. And you cannot point, I would challenge either of you, to a president uh, in the last decade who has done nearly so well as this president in Hamburg and in Warsaw. Well, we remember, of course, a, a, a lot of Americans do, John F. Kennedy's first meeting with Nikita Khrushchev in 1961. I think it was in Vienna. Yes. And what did Khrushchev draw from that? that Kennedy was a very weak president who could be taken advantage of. And the now, Cuban Missile Crisis followed it, without, it did. with now, I don't uniform think, I don't, acceptance. Yes, I don't think Vladimir Putin uh, came to that conclusion today. Yeah, and I don't think Xi Jinping two hours has with, either. Yeah. Molly, your thoughts? Well, it's, so, it's just so interesting how the media are so distracted and focused on things like the president's tweet about Podesta or whatnot. Meanwhile, the big boys are in the room. They're actually hammering out a yeah. deal. They're actually, I mean, I, for a first meeting between these two leaders, I think it went about as well as you could have hoped for, mm -hmm. actually making some progress in Syria, which is one of the areas on mm -hmm. which uh, Russia and the U.S. have some shared interests. There are a lot of problems. I mean, they are an adversary. They do have the capability of annihilating our country because of their nuclear powers. We do need to make sure that we, we don't just quite. accept their words on meddling. I don't know if that's an, 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 appropriately an aside, Molly, uh, when we're talking about the two uh, uh, largest nuclear powers in the world. Uh, it, it's, to me, it was, it was gratifying. It was, uh, in point of fact, exhilarating to see well, the United States a power on the world stage once again with a man who knows what the hell he's doing uh, and who means to do what he can in the national interest. 
And uh, actually getting a deliverable, too, is the important thing. I mean, oh. they walked away with actually something to show for this said. meeting, and that is, that is a nice first step. Molly, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Molly Hemingway. Fred, good to see you. Fred Barnes. Thank you. A few thoughts now on President Trump rolling back the madness of Barack Obama and the left. At the same point in Mr. Obama's presidency, he was jet-setting around the globe on his infamous apology tour, apologizing to France and to Europe, claiming the United States had been arrogant in our foreign policy. Trump, uh, uh, well, he's been more productively engaged while uh, Obama was apologizing to the Muslim world, stating it was his responsibility as president. This is actually what a president of the United States said. To fight against negative stereotypes of Islam. That was President Obama's big number one priority. Well, four years later, Obama's red line failure assured the now current crisis and worsening crisis in Syria. That is worsening until President Trump and Vladimir Putin got together today. President Obama's inaction paved the way for Putin to take Crimea and to later invade eastern Ukraine. Thankfully, Mr. Obama is irrelevant today. It has a reassuring sound, doesn't it? Obama is irrelevant. Let's hope so. His failed legacy is being methodically dismantled by President Trump while he leads the free world. Mr. Trump is replacing Obama's policy of appeasement and passivity with a doctrine of American exceptionalism and a defense of Western values, of Western civilization itself. President Trump set the tone for, days, for today's meeting with Putin, calling on Russia to cease its destabilizing activities in Ukraine, to end its support for hostile governments in Syria and Iran. Today, President Trump comes away with a deal reaching a Syria ceasefire agreement. A Wall Street Journal op-ed defined Mr. Trump's governing philosophy this way, quote, Mr. Trump is taking a clear stand against the kind of gauzy globalism and vague multiculturalism represented by the worldview of, say, Barack Obama. And most contemporary Western intellectuals who are willing, even eager, to concede the argument to critics of the West traditions. President Trump certainly is not among them. Trump emerged from this summit as the true leader of the free world. He's now lifting two continents at once, ours and Europe's, and putting Putin, Merkel, Macron, and the rest of the G20 in their place. And oh yes, in so doing, he has put Mr. Obama in his place as well. Illinois Governor Rauner today blasting the state legislature for collapsing under the pressure of entrenched interest at issue a budget passed in a democratically controlled state house that includes five billion of tax hikes. The income tax rate rises by 32 percent. No attention paid, or at least not much, to the fact that Illinois already has 15 billion in unpaid bills, 251 billion. Let's round it off. A quarter of a trillion dollars and unfunded pension liabilities, and the problems only start there. My next guest is offering a unique solution to Illinois' budget crisis. He says we should dissolve Illinois and just wipe, wipe it off the map. The leading columnist of all of the state of uh, Illinois, columnist for the Chicago Tribune, the esteemed John Cass, I'm pleased to call a great friend. Good to have you with us. Hey, and Lou. How are you? I'm great, I'm, and I feel somehow so much richer uh, sitting here in New York than in Illinois. The problem you should. You, the problems you guys allow these Democrats to create, did the Republicans have anything to do with it as well? I, I don't know. Well, the re some Republicans gave the Democrats, uh, um, what do we call that, cover for the vote. <laughs> we have a combine in Illinois, uh, you know, Democrats and combine Republicans. You have it in Washington as well, you see it every day yeah. where you wonder, why aren't these leaders doing what should be, well, that, you figure it out. So, yeah. um, in so, Illinois, well, I'm thinking... I, I just got to ask you, John, where's Rahm Emanuel? Yeah. When, I mean, because he should be... He never, no, he's wasting another crisis. He's created so I many... Thought he, 
I thought he was in New York uh, opining about uh, the trains running on time or getting in a fight between the Post, the Daily News, and, uh, and the New York Times over his vision. Yeah, his vision. Yeah, it's pathetic. Well, de Blasio, I, at least you know we can brag, he's over there in, G, in G20 with the anarchists holding forth on the path of exactly. Western civilization if he has his way, and we're pleased to report he will not have his way. I, what, what is the solution Chicago here? mayors know to show up at a, at a cop's funeral when a police officer yeah. is dead. I can no one here Chicago is surprised. No one here is so, surprised at, at Mayor de Blasio. Uh, his uh, absolute, uh, it's not a disregard, it's utter disrespect for our law enforcement officers and first responders. The man is, uh, I, I've never seen such a big man so small. He is just, uh, it's, it's amazing. But you've got a lot of little people at work in Illinois as well, and they're not getting much done. Where does this all lead? Uh, it leads to more and more taxes because the Democrats used uh, Moody's warning that Oh, if there if there aren't if we don't raise taxes, we'll, the bonds will go to junk. And then, right as they were raising them, Moody's came out saying, "Well, even if you do raise them, the fact that you haven't done any structural reforms means the bonds could probably go to junk anyway, because they haven't addressed the central problem, which is in every state that you have big t big machine Democrats running it, they." They promise a lot to the unions, they get the union support, the public unions, and then uh, they stick the middle class with the bill yeah. while they make fortunes on the side doing whatever they do. And so middle, the middle class of Illinois are trying to flee, and that's why I thought if we dissolve the state, Lou, you know, I, I was going to try to call the governor of Indiana, and Walker was busy, maybe they could take parts of us and just you know dissolve us so we might be ruled by others uh, dissolution uh, before insolvency uh, it's got a catchy ring to it you can use it if you want john john great to have you with us thank uh, let's you. continue the conversation come back soon i hope so thank john you john cas thanks so much my friend the heads of the house oversight committee today saying former national security advisor general michael flan probably broke the law when he failed to disclose income from Russia and Turkey. As a former military officer, you simply cannot take money from Russia, Turkey, or anybody else. Uh, and it appears as if he did take that money, it was inappropriate, uh, and there are repercussions for the violation of law. Such violations punishable by up to five years in prison, although it'd be up to the president's Justice Department, to decide whether ultimately to charge General Flynn. Joining me now to discuss the latest on Michael Flynn, the Trump administration's efforts to avoid a government shutdown, and left-wing activist judges who seem to be working overtime to undermine the Trump agenda. The co-host of The Five, Kimberly Guilfoyle, and uh, a new time for the five. Yes, nine, 9 p.m. Eastern live. And a so terrific it beginning it was. Yeah, well, we're very grateful to all the Fox News loyal fans that showed up for us last night. And we could kindly ask you to do it again tonight <laughs> <laughs> and going forward. <laughs> I, I, I think that is like a, they show an up for you. Invitation. Yes, uh, exactly. For a while. Exactly. Let, let's start with General Flynn. Mm -hmm. uh, you're an attorney, former prosecutor. Right. Is it worth the, anybody's trouble to prosecute him on this? Can you just Im imagine? I mean, really. So, I, look, I don't, I don't know, you know, what Sessions is going to do or the Justice sure. Department is going to uh, ultimately decide. I'm sure they will do a full and thorough and fair review of, um, you know, the claims here and potential mm -hmm. charges. But I don't know that any justice is going to be served by going after him and what specifically his intentions were at the time in terms of, you know, well, willful failure to yeah. disclose. And, you know, so it's, it's I a do. I will situation. say one thing. What? It's pretty clear right now to me, mm -hmm. uh, uh, who's been supporting uh, President Trump from the beginning, uh, that it's a good thing he went off the rails when he did uh, this general, because I think he could have been a major problem if he had these kinds of oversights. Mm -hmm. That's not an that's not a demonstration of good judgment, particularly the judgment you want uh, on your uh, uh, national security council. No, absolutely, it's such an important position, yeah. and especially given what's going on in you know different, uh, very active and volatile geopolitical areas. Yeah. We've seen so much activity, you know, with North Korea. Isn't and it Russia, funny how things Iran, work out? Syria. H.R. McMaster's. Yeah. 
He's doing pretty good. For, huh? So far, so good. Solid choice. We give him two thumbs up, one from me, one from Dobbs. There you go. And, <laughs> and I guess we're out of thumbs. So. We're out of thumbs, yeah. Let, let, let's turn to uh, this, this sanctuary city order today, uh. blocking at a temporary stay, in part blocked. Uh, by another, you know, Ninth Circuit court out there in the in, in the in the in the great uh, beyond, uh, at least in in judicial terms. Mm -hmm. What is going on? Why are activist judges like this, this left wingers appointed by Obama, able to shut down in the the presidency of the United States? It's just awful, really. It's just you know, radical ideology run amok, and they're legislating from the bench, and they're not supposed to do that. So, but you see that they do it with you know, just willful abandon, no problem, just going to do whatever they want. Uh, it it really is a serious issue, and I you know prosecuted cases and worked in a sanctuary city. I was first lady of a sanctuary city, so I know intimately and the problems that Francisco. prevail. There's Absolutely. no more sanctuary than San Francisco. I mean, it's, yeah, it's the top of the pack, you know. Yeah. So, but really, when you see the amount of crime and the revolving door of people going back in and back with this catch and release, you can't ask anybody their true identity. I'll they have 17 aliases, and God forbid you, you try know, and fingerprint them and on. find out who they are. It goes on and on. Kate Steinle, the yeah. tragedy of, of her murder. Uh, and and the idea that we have to have executive orders and uh, and an attorney general begging the administrators, mayors uh, of cities across the country to please just do one thing: follow the law. Follow the law. Can you imagine that? No, I like can't. you take an oath to uphold the law. So is it too much to ask to tell them to follow the law and actually enforce the laws on the books? I mean, this is what's so depressing to me and demoralizing. And right. you have like Border Patrol agents putting on the line every day. And the previous administration was more interested in prosecuting them and castigating them than they were in letting them do their job and giving them resources to do so. Them being the Border Patrol yeah. agents themselves who are thrilled to have a new uh, they sure uh, president uh, at 1600 uh, joining, a, I think, a vast majority uh, across the country. Good to see you. Have fun tonight. Me too, Lou. And uh, congratulations on the new show, The New Time, 9 o'clock with The Five, it. led by Kimberly Guilfoyle <laughs> on the Fox News Channel. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Be sure to vote in our poll tonight. Do you believe the deep state judiciary is putting Americans at risk for partisan purposes in protecting sanctuary cities? Cast your vote on Twitter at Lou Dobbs and follow me on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. Like me on Facebook. Follow me on Instagram at Lou Dobbs tonight. On Wall Street today, stocks again, sharp gains, a big rally on Wall Street. The Dow surging 232 points, the S&P up 14, the Nasdaq gaining 42 points, closing above 6,000 for the first time in history. Volume on the big board picking up again, just under 4 billion shares. Caterpillar, the biggest contributor to the Dow gain, shares of Cat up 7% after an earnings beat. Good news for the housing market, new home sales and prices both climbing nearly 6%. A reminder to listen to my reports three times a day, coast to coast on the Salem Radio Network. Up. The Trump administration today targeting trade abuses by Canada, imposing a tariff on Canadian lumber. President Trump also vowed to take care of our nation's dairy farmers, warning Canada that a tariff on our dairy products uh, is a problem. Fox News senior correspondent Mike Tobin in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, with our report. U.S. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross called it a bad week for U.S.-Canada relations as he outlined a new tariff on softwood lumber imported from Canada to the U.S. The duty ranges between 3 and 24 percent, costing Canada $1 billion, as estimated by the Department of Commerce. President Trump did not hide that the latest shot was in response to protective pricing by Canadian dairy farmers. He tweeted, Canada has made business for our dairy farmers in Wisconsin and other border states very difficult. We will not stand for this. Watch. Canada, what they've done to our dairy farm workers is a disgrace. Farms like the Phil Maru Dairy in Wisconsin depended on what is called ultra-filtered milk that was sold into Canada. But Canadian dairy farmers drove the price down and the U.S. out of competition. 75 dairies in Wisconsin and New York were notified on April 1st that they would no longer have a buyer for their milk on May the 1st. After seven generations, this farm owned by the Gartman family was looking at the potential of shutting down. We would have to have an auction. We would have to sell the cows. There, there, there's, uh, yeah, that, that would be our only option. 
Lost revenue to U.S. farms is estimated at $150 million. At the end of the month, U.S. dairy farmers will be faced with the problem of too much milk, not enough buyers. If you dump your milk, then you have no way to get paid for it, and you can't pay your bills. Canada says that the problem has always been U.S. overproduction of dairy, not Canadian protectionist pricing. The challenges that the dairy industry faces in the United States and in Canada is a global market issue, not one that is caused by Canada. The Canadian Minister of Foreign Affairs, as well as the Minister of Natural Resources, issued a sharp rebuke to the U.S. tariff on wood, calling it unfair and punitive also stating that it will increase the price of new homes, putting them out of reach for tens of thousands of American home buyers. Canada depends on the United States. 75% of their exports are bought in the U.S. It's only 18% U.S. to Canada. The president said today he does not fear a trade war because Canada has a surplus, the U.S. a deficit. Lou, back to you. Why, thank you, Mike Tobin. And Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, as I said, uh, will be joining us here next. A few thoughts now as members of Congress are trickling back into our nation's capital, particularly congressmen and women who've heard an earful from their constituents, many of whom can't quite understand why the Republican Party, in control of the House, the Senate, and the presidency, can't get anything done. Why they refuse to help, for example, the president move his agenda ahead. And Lord, they don't like Speaker Ryan. Forty percent of voters view him negatively. Almost twice as many do so as those who like him, up from 5 percent in February. And a vast majority of Americans are just unimpressed by Congress altogether. Nearly three quarters disapprove of Congress's job performance. That's up 12 points just since February. There's no mystery about why. The Dems in Congress want a government shutdown. Speaker Ryan seems indifferent and cooperative with the Democrats as usual. Ryan joins with the Dems in blocking funding of the border wall. The White House and Ryan already at odds on tax reform ahead of the president's announcement that coming tomorrow. Ryan screwed up the repeal and replacement of Obamacare, a congressional source slamming Ryan. He told Politico, quote, it's Paul Ryan's world and we're all just living in it. Ryan's world is an absurdist dream. He's managed to push through in his entire 18 years only three bills into law. He was plucked from anonymity and ineptitude to join Mitt Romney on the Republican ticket in 2012. They lost, of course, and then in the battle to remove John Boehner as Speaker, the Freedom Caucus and others were persuaded that Boehner's pal Ryan would make just a brilliant choice. They were incredibly wrong. And now, faced with the prospect of a government shutdown, a Ryan refusal to fund the border wall, and absolutely a hapless speaker on the issue of tax reform who wants to transfer taxes from business to consumers, well, once again, in the renewed effort to repeal and replace Obamacare, this fellow Ryan has it all mucked up to a fairly well. Lord, Mr. Ryan. Keep your perks. Keep that fancy airplane the taxpayers fund to ferry you home and back each and every weekend. And then we'll let you use it for more boondoggles like the one you just went on to see the world. But please, please, just get out of the way. Please, we've got a nation that needs to be led. Now, the quotation of the evening. This one from President Donald J. Trump, who said this. Sometimes you need conflict in order to come up with a solution. Through weakness, oftentimes, you can't make the right sort of settlement. So I'm aggressive, but I also get things done. And in the end, everybody likes me. Well, there you are. But not necessarily you, Mr. Ryan. You need to get moving. We're coming right back. President Trump today signed his 26th executive order alongside his new agriculture secretary, newly confirmed, Sonny Perdue. The order establishes a task force to identify ways to boost growth in our agricultural sector, and it follows the president's criticism of Canadian practices that he says have been hurting our dairy farmers. I love Canada, but they've outsmarted our politicians for many years. Our farmers deserve a government that serves their interests and empowers them. Uh, we're going to take care of our dairy farmers in Wisconsin and upstate New York and lots of other places. 
And the United States recording its slowest economic growth in five years in 2016 as trade deficits dragged on the economy. Gross domestic product last year up 1.6 percent, down from 2.6 percent the previous year. And our trade deficit with Canada, uh, almost $12 billion. Trade deficits with Mexico totaling about $60 billion a year. And the United States has roughly a $347 billion trade deficit in goods with China. Joining us now to talk about the Trump administration's prospects uh, uh, and what it is doing to assure uh, stronger economic growth and, uh, and responsible balanced trade is Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, who is leading the administration's efforts. Mr. Secretary, it is great to have you with us. I know you're as busy as, uh, as you could possibly be. Uh, going uh, uh, going after all of these issues. Let's start with the one that you highlighted today, and that is not, uh, uh, and that's straightforwardly on lumber, softwood lumber, which Canada, some say, has been dumping uh, lumber in this country for a very long time, uh, supported by subsidies in Canada. Well, unfortunately, Lou, it's true. Uh, the way it works in Canada is that the provinces own the standing timber, and they charge very, very low, way below market fees for what's called stumpage, namely the right to cut the trees down. That, in turn, lets the Canadians ship lumber into the U.S. at a subsidized price. Right. They now have gotten up to 31.5% market share in the whole U.S. market, and this debate, as you correctly point out, has been going on for quite a while. Now, you've, you've also put them on notice that this had to change. It hasn't changed. Uh, no surprise, frankly, in that, given the way other administrations, previous administrations, had treated the problem. Uh, but now uh, you're going to do what? Well, we're finding them a bit. The preliminary finding was a fine of $1 billion per year. And since we are imposing it retroactively for 90 days when we put them on notice, that'll be an extra one-time $250 million. And they began paying those fines today. And uh, you have put, uh, you've connected the, the hose, if you will, to a, an important source of revenue going forward with these, uh, these fines, uh, plus the countervailing duties. Uh, ha has our government been successful in collecting uh, these fines? Well, historically, not so. When I first entered the Department of Commerce, I learned to my horror that there are literally billions of dollars of uncollected countervailing duties and other tariffs. And the reason for it was they never required the importers to put up any kind of bonds or letters of credit. So by the time you would win the trade case, there'd be no financial resources left in the shell company. So you'd win a case, but there'd be no benefit from it. So it's, it's pretty ridiculous because it's so hard, takes so long and so much expense to win a trade case. At least you ought to collect the darn tariffs when you get them. I have to say, uh, Mr. Secretary, I'm smiling here tonight because I'm thinking back to the campaign trail when so often uh, President Trump would be talking about we've got to have a smart government. We have got to behave smartly. Uh, and it, it appears almost every issue that uh, you, uh, the president and others in the administration point to about uh, involving previous administration of our government, we, we've been abject fools. Well, I don't know if they were careless or foolish or thinking something else, but whatever, it wasn't done the way that we're doing it. They right. weren't emphasizing enforcement. They weren't really thinking through the issues. Now, just take these two issues that's concerned the president in the last week, the diafiltered milk and the lumber. If we had a really well-functioning trade agreement, why would those have to come to this sort of collision course end result? The whole idea of a trade agreement is to make things go smoothly. Yeah. To create a, a, an architecture, a mechanism for resolution and, uh, and ultimately equity. 
I, you are obviously it. working toward creating balance in our trade relationship, something we haven't seen in this country in 40 years. Uh, and that's very encouraging uh, to those of us who, who pay attention to trade and who know how important it is. I'm wondering, is there, are you open to ideas about, for example, uh, reports on the impact of trade deficits on economic growth, uh, on reports on uh, the impact, actually the uh, numerical report, just on the number of companies and employees involved in outsourcing and offshoring so that uh, we can all better understand what is happening to the economy as a result of the woeful trade practices that have been uh, pursued for too long in this country. Well, it's huge. Uh, as the president is fond of citing, 70,000 manufacturing plants have closed in the U.S. since NAFTA was originated. Now, not all of that was due to NAFTA, but some of it right. was. Some was due to other things. But imagine 70,000 plants being gone. Figure out how many people per plant. You're talking about a heck of a lot of jobs. Absolutely. And uh, and jobs that I know uh, concern the president and concern you. And we're seeing you uh, uh, and the administration in action. And I have to tell you, it's uh, it's heartening to do so. And it is great to see you, Mr. Secretary. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Thank you very much, Lou. Good to talk with you again. Wilbur Ross, Commerce Secretary. Me and Revolutionary Guard fast attack craft in the Persian Gulf. This happening yesterday, Fox News reporting the Iranian ship came within a thousand yards of the guided missile destroyer USS Mahan with its weapons manned. In January, the Mahan fired warning shots at an Iranian warship near the Strait of Ormuz. Joining me now, retired four-star general, Fox News military analyst, General Jack Keane. General, good to see you. Another provocation in the Persian Gulf by the Iranians. Yeah, they get charged up by this. They... What they're trying to do is really send a message to our allies in the region that, that look, we're the dominating force in the Middle East. It's not the United States. We can intimidate them and harass them. They don't respond. Eventually, it, it, they know what our rules of engagement are because they've tested us, and they know how far to go. If they go too far, we're going to shoot them. We give them warning shots and do other things, you know, let them know that uh, you, you're coming into the danger zone. That threshold obviously has not been breached, uh, even under uh, this president, uh, General Mattis, the Secretary of Defense. Uh, do you think that's going to change? Well, what they have given uh, our military commanders is authorities that the Obama administration should have given them all along. That is, you deal with your, your enemy situation, you adapt to it, you don't have to ask permission, use the resources you have against the problem that you have, whether that's in Syria, whether it's in Iraq whether it's in Yemen or here in the Gulf. I want to, I want to put up a map very quickly of Afghanistan, uh, speaking of General Mattis, Secretary Mattis, uh, a, a surprise trip to Afghanistan where the Taliban have made further inroads and, uh, in fact, now control at least 40 percent of the country. We have 9,000 of our troops there. Uh, your thoughts about what is happening there, what uh, Mattis's message likely was, both to our troops and to the Afghans. Yeah, we have a real problem here, Lou. We've been here for 16, almost 16 years. And sadly to say, this war is not winnable. I mean, the commander there talks about it being a stalemate. It's not a stalemate because the, the Taliban actually have the momentum. They have the initiative. And you can say, I mean, American people say, how can that happen with the United States of America? We're fighting a war for 16 years and we're sort of losing after all this time. Well, Obama's policies that drove us to this point. Right. He never gave McChrystal and Petraeus the forces they need when they put together a winning strategy. He cut it by 25 percent and pulled it out 15 months later. It was a disgrace. And then he pulled out all the resources that were actually enabling the Afghan army to function effectively. What would be your recommendation to the president? He's got to shut down the two sanctuaries that are in Pakistan that two presidents have refused to do. We finally got to do that. You cannot defeat an insurgency because the Afghan Taliban have those sanctuaries. We're going to have to give the give the Afghan National Army the enabling functions that they need. What about destroying all of the poppy fields? Sixteen years, we never did it. Well, we don't do it because there's an economic issue associated with it that the people are dependent on, and it's kind of their their issue. It's their economics, not ours. Well, we wouldn't do it without permission of the government to do. That's the problem we got. 
getting out right now sounds like an awfully good idea, General. <laughs> good to have you with us, General Jack. Good seeing you. <laughs> In our online poll last night, we asked, if the Dems refuse to fund the wall, would you blame them if the government shuts down as a result? 90% of you say, yes, you would blame the Dems. A couple of hundred agitators, demonstrators, funded by George Soros. Today stormed the lobby of the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C. They were yelling, water, not walls, referring to Flint, Michigan, accusing the Heritage Foundation of being, of being President Trump's think tank. These folks didn't quite understand that this president and the Heritage Foundation had not a thing to do with President Obama's Flint, Michigan problem. Ah, amazing. Joining me now, political analyst attorney Gail Trotter, Washington Times opinion editor, Fox News contributor Charlie Hurt. Gail, how do you explain? <laughs> why would anybody try to explain the reality to these people? Why? Would, I mean, now they are attacking think tanks for crying out loud. <laughs> Right, they don't get it, but let me tell you, Lou, that this might be a great time for some unity in Washington, D.C. I would love to see the liberal D.C. think tanks join together and say that I stand with the Heritage Foundation. This is a very diff uh, dangerous precedent. We yeah. saw something like this happen at the Family Research Council a few years ago. When Not someone like this. This is a whole new level. I mean, this is, this is outrageous. And obviously it it's because of the importance of the Heritage Foundation and the effectiveness uh, of, its, uh, of its work. Uh, Charlie, I mean, I, I'm just thinking about my friends at the Heritage Foundation <laughs> even being associated with the left-wing think tank for any reason. Uh, it, it is, solidarity isn't the, uh, the mission here, is it? No, it really isn't. Uh, and actually, you know, if these people uh, wanted to do something useful, what they could do is go to Flint, Michigan, and protest in all of the po the, oh. the offices of politicians there that actually uh, allowed the problem, uh, the actual problem that occurred there with the water. But of course, they wouldn't do that because all of those politicians, every single one of them, is a Democrat, yeah. like them, and they're not going to go there and and protest those people because these people are partisan hacks. Well, as we as we pray for rationality and, and, and good hearts, uh, the border wall, uh, the president uh, making it clear he's open to withdrawing uh, his request for funding fiscal uh, 17 in favor of fiscal 18 uh, in order to avoid shutting the government down. Uh, is this, uh, Gail, uh, do you support the president in this or do you think he's making a mistake? It's probably a good strategic move. He doesn't have to give up one of his signature campaign promises of building the wall, but he can avoid tying it to this broken appropriation system that we have in Washington called, right now. It's called Paul Ryan. Uh, there, I mean, that's he's the principal break, don't you think, Charlie? Well, certainly, uh, you know, both Democrats and Republicans in Congress are to blame for the, this impasse. Yeah, but the Republicans in, in, are the majority. And absolutely, absolutely. And, and, but, but Donald Trump, in his first 100 days, has done more than the past five presidents, than the past 40 years of Congresses have in, in, in stopping the, stemming the flow of illegal immigration across the border. Mm -hmm. It is extraordinary what he has done. And the idea that these people who have been work, allegedly working at this problem for years, going back to, remember the 2006 Secure Fence Act that people like Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, they voted for and, and, then, and then failed to, to uh, supply the funding for? I can, uh, I can remember Duncan, Congressman Duncan Hunter, a father of the current yep. congressman, uh, telling me, Lou, uh, we did it. I've got uh, absolute assurance that they have to build 750 miles of fence on that border. And Gail, they didn't get close. Nope. No, of course not. And I think that this is a great opportunity to push forward on this. And you see that illegal boarding, border crossings are down so much. So even this new attitude has resulted yep. in positive change. Absolutely. Uh, uh, this president, to his credit, positive change on so many quarters. Did I mention another big 200-point rally today on Wall Street? Gail Trotter, Charlie Hurt, thank you both for being with us. You Great to be with you. That's it for us tonight. Thanks for being with us. Uh, White House Counselor Kellyanne Conway, Congresswoman Marsha Blackburn, and Colonel Tony Schaefer among our guests here tomorrow night. We hope you'll be with us. Thanks for being with us tonight. Good night from New York.